AT&T believes that your phone is part of what makes you, you. So we understand why you're holding it as you go about your daily activities. Because, truth, nothing should come between you and your connectivity. AT&T 5G is fast, reliable, and secure. And it keeps you connected to family, friends, fun, everything you care about. You'll enjoy fast speeds while you download apps, share your videos, or get your game on. All thanks to AT&T 5G. Requires compatible plan and device. Coverage not available everywhere. Learn more at att.com slash 5G for you. This is Holly Fry from Stuff You Missed in History Class. Toyota is a leader when it comes to electrified vehicles. Today, battery EVs make up less than 10% of new vehicles sold because of higher cost and concerns about range and charging. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon-neutral future. With an electrified, diversified lineup of hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery EVs, Toyota empowers you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint. Learn more and get details at toyota.com slash beyondzero. Toyota, let's go places. It's time. Time to get credit for the work you've done. Time to get the recognition you deserve. With Purdue Global, you can move forward in your career, for your family, and for yourself. You're worth the investment in yourself to earn a degree you're proud of, a degree that employers will respect. Purdue's online university is designed to support working adults like you who know it's never too late to accomplish your goals. It's never too late to make a comeback. It's time to start yours today at purdueglobal.edu. This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I'm your host, Ray Arkins, and I'm sitting here on a rainy Monday morning recording this this beautiful intro that uh, I know so many of you love because you uh, get to know the comings and goings of my life. Just kidding. I actually recently got a uh, comment on uh, YouTube. and th- This always, I wouldn't say bothers me, but it irks me where the person left a comment somewhere along the lines of, Hey, remember who you're interviewing, dude. And I get it. There are times where I talk about myself, but that's the nature of podcasting. And I think people that leave those sort of comments or throw that criticism my direction are people who are frankly not used to this format and not used to the idea of a conversation rather than a stereotypical interview. And usually most of the hate that I get is really all directed on YouTube just because, you know, I throw these episodes up there and it goes out to the uh, the unwashed internet and uh, those people can dive in and out and be like, what is this? This isn't even an interview. I want to hear the guest and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I get it. I get it. That's why these people are on the show. But, uh, you know, there are times where I'm bringing my own personal baggage or anecdotes or stories and um, it adds to the conversation, hopefully, because then in turn, it will have the interview subject being able to spin off that idea and anyways but I, I digress here we are i haven't even introduced the guest the guest this week is a very special one for me personally he's been on my list like you know you come up with a list of things when you start to do something and you're like oh i'd like to accomplish these things he is a person who i've always kind of circled around and been like oh i i randomly hit him up on twitter but you know i can tell he doesn't use that platform a ton and I just always wanted him on the show. Then I get hit up by his publicist, and I was like, oh, man, this sounds perfect. So Steve Kleisnith. Kleisnith? Yeah, I'm, I'm butchering his name. But Steve Kleisnith, that's what I'm going to go ahead and go with. He is the drummer for Further Seems Forever, as well as Strong Arm. And he also played a stint in Shy Halud as well. Um, Further Seems Forever is doing some reunion shows recently, playing that record, How to Start a Fire from Front to Back, which I get to see this week. I am incredibly excited about it. I get to meet Steve in person. But the reason that he was so important for me to have on the show is the fact that Strong Arm was a huge band for me. When I first started to get into hardcore and like the heavier side of music, uh, I, I, I didn't go in to the heavy music stuff with a uh, slant towards metal. It was definitely more on the, you know, hardcore punk side of things. So, and I also, I, and I still profess to be a Christian. So I have a spiritual connection to the big man upstairs. Um, and strong arm was like, Holy shit. It was unbelievable. Like the connection that I felt with the band and the fact that I, they were singing about these things that were, 
um, you know, spiritual in nature, but could apply across the board to anybody struggling with anything internal. And the record Advent of a Miracle was so huge for me. Um, between that band and Focal Point, Suffering in the Masses, both of those records were just like cornerstones to me understanding expression and the way that people could uh, talk about their feelings in a very safe manner. So uh, Steve was great on the show, and uh, I'll, I'll get to our interview in a moment, but um, I'm not at South by Southwest. I know many of you that could be listening to this as we speak on the airplane back from South by Southwest to wherever it is you're going. Um, I, I, I don't know if I like the festival. I've been, I think for t- uh, two years I went and, uh, I hadn't been, f- I've been for a couple of years. It's, it's cool. It's fun. And I, you know, I like to see people who I haven't seen in quite some time, but it's just, it's exhausting. And if I don't really have some justification for me to be there from a business perspective, I'm not going to take time away from my family and the, the fun stuff that I have going on at home. So, uh, yeah, no South by Southwest for me. And uh, honestly, I'm kind of glad about that. I think for me, once every five years is really all I need. Um, even though there's really exciting things, I'm more drawn to the technology side of things, not even so much the music. Uh, but there is some incredible stuff going on in the technology space and with my day job in regards to podcasting. And it's just, uh, there, yeah, there's some exciting stuff. So I'd find myself maybe going down there more so for that than the actual music, which is weird to say. But I think also because ever since uh, Emos went away, where that was like, you know, the bedrock and cornerstone of like the all ages scene within Austin. Like, of course, there's still a lot of great clubs and there are a lot of great people doing amazing things down there, which I get to be in Austin in early April, which I'm excited about. Um, I feel like once that venue went away, even though to be clear too, red seven booked by a good friend, Ron Martinez, I think he still books there. (laughs) Uh, it, both of those were are just amazing clubs. And once emos went away, I was kind of like, Oh, that's sad. There was no more of that sort of stuff going on. But anyways, I digress. And, uh, yeah, like I said, let's, let's, let's dive into Steve. Um, he, I, I didn't know how to approach this interview because, uh, you know, he hasn't been in the interview circuit for quite some time and I wasn't exactly sure how he was going to take these line of questions, but he was so excited and so willing to go to the deepest, darkest corners of his memory and unearth these, these gems that, uh, I just wasn't aware of, which was awesome. So without, uh, for, oh, I was promised myself I wasn't going to say without further ado, Remember that from last week? Yeah. Oh, geez. All right. So here's my conversation with Steve, and I hope you enjoy. Yeah, that, that, that feels good. Hopefully I can lock into that and then say that a lot, and then you guys will be like, hey, you say that like every single time <laughs> you go into an interview. And so, uh, yeah, and then I'll have to change it from there. So the struggle, right? The struggle in using words. So here is my discussion with Steve, and I will talk to you after the interview is over. I, I do that, too. For those of you that like immediately shut off the podcast <laughs> once the, uh, the the farewells are said, um, stick around for like 10 more seconds. And uh, usually I like to reveal the guests for the upcoming week. So anyways, here's Steve. I definitely, like I was mentioning before, um, you know, S- strong arm was, was this kind of revelatory thing to me because... Uh, the you know, coming coming from the sort of you know punk and hardcore scene here in Orange County, there was a really really big push, especially in the um, uh, right around when I started to go to shows in like ninety six ninety seven. Um, I just noticed this really distinct divide of like, all right, well here's where the Christian hardcore bands play, and here's where all the rest of the hardcore bands play. Like never never the two shall meet, and if they do, it could be quite awkward. Um, and it just to me it was never like oh, I, I don't I don't get that. I get that there are two ideologically uh different bands but why they can't they share the same bill um is it is it strange for you to obviously still have this uh obviously like i was mentioning before this connection that uh people still bring up strong arm where it's just like well you know that was something i i you know i I presume was obviously very passionate at the time but at the same time i'm sure as in most young people's bands kind of accidental that you guys were doing what you were doing in, in certain respects right well, I wasn't, I wasn't an original member of Strong Arm, so I was the drummer on the second record, The Advent of a Miracle. Exactly. In which the drummer on the first album became the singer. Right. Um, on the Advent. Um, it's funny you mentioned the, uh, the division. I don't remember, I mean, I, I'm not doubting you. I'm, obviously there was. I'm, 
for, for some bizarre reason, when it came to strong arm, we, we did shows on the West Coast that were actually with regular groups, usually. Like, I remember one in particular, I guess the first thing that shot into my mind after you mentioned that, that sort of period of time was uh, the Showcase Theater. Of course. I think is what it was called. And, uh, and then I remember us doing a, a, a pretty awesome variety kind of hardcore show. It was like us, and then it was Unbroken, and it was Mean Season, and um, get a band called Gehenna, I believe. And so oh, yeah. we were actually the only, we were actually the only Christian band, or what you would call a Christian band, on that bill um, when we played in California. And then you know, obviously I did some stuff with Shiloh, or did touring with Shiloh as well. And actually Strongarm and Shiloh, you know, that's interesting. That's an interesting dynamic too, because Strongarm and Shiloh would tour together. Right. So I would be doing a double set every night. So the uh, you know being completely uh, wiped out <laughs> by the end of the night. But, I mean, that was a, a correlation of a regular group, I guess, and a Christian group. And uh, the people, if I can recall correctly, that would go to the shows, I mean, we would always seem to coexist and enjoy it just fine. Now, I will say that there, to my recollection, there were certain areas, I just don't remember California being one of them, but, I, you know, obviously we were only there maybe a few times here and there. Right. So uh, as far as going that far on a tour, Atlanta right. was definitely a city. When we played Atlanta, that feature definitely existed where it would either be a division or it would be your secular people coming to the show to heckle us, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, that some of the, um, I guess you would call secular hardcore kids would be part of a lot of different groups that were sort of anti-religious or sort of, a, you know, of that ilk. And they would actually come to our shows and sort of mock us, maybe, and things of that nature. Like, I remember that happening on a couple of occasions in Atlanta and, like, some southeastern regions. But I actually don't recall in my own experience having that kind of situation uh, when we when we did shows out west. Sure, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. I, I could see uh, – Yeah, I'll, I'll make the important distinction in regards to that because, yeah, they're definitely – uh, I guess it was no problem with the, the bands playing together, but there definitely always was, and maybe this was the vocal minority, obviously pre-internet where you just had your people being like, Oh, you know, Oh, oh, oh fuck that band. Like, you know, they're whatever, they're a bunch of Christian hardcore kids. Like we're not going to go to that. Right, show. Right. We're not going to watch it or whatever. Uh, but then, yeah, when you actually came down to it and played the show, there wasn't any sort of like outward <laughs> hostility towards anybody um but it was it, yeah it just it, it was strange because i i did start to notice that that vibe where it was like i i, I was you know one of the few friends uh or one of the, the few people in my peer group that you know was really um you know in, in love with strong arm and it's like you had these people that had this uh, you would listen to shy halud but not listen to strong arm just based on the fact they'd be like oh it's like going to church and i was like I like. I mean, I can understand you to a certain extent, but it's like these bands are sonically very, very similar. Like, why can't you listen to both? I was going to not... say, well, if you, if you are listening to Shia Lee from a music perspective, you're listening to Strong Arm, exactly. Because like Josh Colbert, and obviously was Strong Arm, and then further, and Matthew Fox, who was Shia Lee. I mean, just by virtue of friendship, were very close and wrote together all the time, and their stylings were very even though they were very creative and, and definitely went different directions there, there was a similar formula at times as far as the transition and the movement of the music. And so those, those two, those two guys are some of my favorite people to, to create music with from a drum perspective, because the way they write, there's just so much transition and movement in it. And I think that's sort of uh, assisted in the uniqueness of our sound from time to time, as opposed to your chugga chugga or kind of regular stylings of a lot of hardcore uh, during that period of time. But, Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um and you uh, you yourself you were born in in virginia but then migrated down to florida at, at what age did that happen for you um i was born in fredericksburg virginia grew up in alexandria virginia just south of dc and then i moved down to florida still with my family uh i believe when i was 10 or 11 so i was still relatively young i moved to tampa florida lived in the tampa st pete area for a while um, then was still with my family and actually lived in Texas for a couple of years. Ironically, I lived in Texas in the Dallas area at the same time my bassist Chad Neptune did, but we didn't know each other, of course, or <laughs> hadn't met yet. Right. But we both lived in that Dallas Fort Worth area for, you know, or in my case, just a couple of years. I think Chad may live there longer with his family, living in the same area and not realizing it until we talked about it just 
randomly through conversation, like, like years later. I mean, even after knowing each other years later. Um, and then I went, came back to Tampa, graduated high school in Tampa, Florida, moved to South Florida in 1995 to join strong arm. Uh, we were already sort of acquaintances to friends. They had come up to play some shows in Tampa and they had a, like attended a, at the time, a church that I was drumming at and they sort of had viewed me play and they, you know, they liked what they saw or, or heard. And they, they were like, you know, I guess when they had a situation where they needed a drummer, they had called upon me if I'd be interested. And so I, uh, wanted, eventually just wanted up moving down to South Florida, joined strong arm. Obviously we had a period of time where we were touring or at least trying to tour full time. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, from that Shia Lude followed soon after who was also local in South Florida. And, uh, wanted up drumming for them and sort of doing both bands for a little while. And then from there, naturally, uh, you know, it uh, morphed, at least as far as strong arm, when it morphed into just wanting to write something different musically, sort of being old of just being pigeonholed into a definitive genre of music. And so we just started writing other stuff that would be more equated in, in the rock vein. And then uh, eventually uh, befriended through the local music scene with Chris, with Chris Caraba, who was in a band called the Bacon Andes at the time. Mm-hmm. And then uh, once that was over, we were writing this new music. We always thought he had a good voice and good stage presence and stuff. So we asked him if he wanted to sing with us. And that birthed uh, Further Seems Forever, I would say, probably in 1998, when we were really first sort of starting to write stuff and and get it together for what would become that band. So a little bit of history. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, the, you moved a lot. What was there a reason behind that? Like, was your family in the military? Uh, like, cause usually that, that kind of, uh, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah. No, they just were doing like my dad was in real estate and my mom was attending like a college that happened to be out in Texas. Okay. Uh, when, as far as when we moved to Texas, mm-hmm. uh, they moved down to Tampa. I'm not really sure why we, I mean, I think it's just, they wanted to live in Florida. Right. from Virginia kind of thing. My dad had worked for the postal service and then he had, uh, he had to wind up quitting mags. He, he got a injury, like a pinched nerve or something and sort of ceased working what he was doing there. And then, um, but yeah, we lived in, um, he used to be in the air force actually. So you would think that that would equate to moving around a lot, but that's not actually the reason we were moving around a lot. But, um, but yeah, now up till, um, I graduated from high school and then pretty much moved uh, soon after that, I moved out, got my own place, was working two jobs, was playing in a band in Tampa that originally was called friend or foe. And then that, then later the name was changed to pole. And that was actually the first actual release on a record label I did was with those guys. And it's uh, the name of the record label uh, record label is stiff pole records. Okay. And the name of the seven inch record is called regret. You can still get it today. The name of the band was called, Pull, P-U-L-L, and uh, it was me and a couple guys, uh, the bassist, who I'm still, it's one of my best friends in the world. We've been friends for over 20 years. We still keep in contact all the time, and that band was interesting, very experimental kind of music. Uh, a lot of, one would classify it maybe as a cross between post-punk and noise kind of thing. Okay. And um, it was on a label that's really more historically known for straight-up punk rock, but what we were doing was something that was completely... <laughs> Left and left field from, yeah. from, from most of the other releases. So it was pretty interesting. Sure. So I was with that group. And then, you know, when strong arm came calling, it sort of pulled pretty much deteriorated at that point. We weren't doing as much stuff anymore. And so I said, Hey, it's a great opportunity. I already know the guys friends with them. So I moved down to South Florida and joined them. And then that obviously, um, that later became further seems forever. I also did live in Tennessee for uh, three years, uh, like I moved down to South Florida in 95. In 2001, uh, it was the one time I was married, actually, and then um, my uh, wife at the time lived, uh, she was from Tennessee and sort of uh, wanted to move back there. So I went along with it and moved to uh, the Tennessee, lived there between uh, 2001 to 2004, and then uh, unfortunately got a divorce. And basically at that point, I was like, all right, well, I mean, I was, the reason I was there was for her. I didn't really know anybody up there. I was sort of on an island. Um, you know, got to know people and, and Tennessee was a beautiful area as far as like outdoorsy stuff went, but, uh, moved back to South Florida in summer of 2004 and I've been living here since then. So, you know, been back here about 12 years now. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're, that's, that's your home base. Um, yep. The, uh, do you have any, do you have any brothers or sisters? I have one older sister who lives in uh, St. Pete, Florida. Her name is Dawn and she's about, like four and a half years older than me, but pretty small family. I mean, it's basically immediate. My mom, dad, 
one sister. Um, unfortunately, you know, all my aunts, uncles, grandparents have all passed away. And, um, I have some distant cousins, don't really uh, keep in contact with too much. Uh, not really on my accord. It just so happens they don't, they're just not really good at keeping in touch. Sure. But uh, a relatively very small family. Uh, my band and my core group of friends is that's in essence is my second family. So. Sure. Sure. Um, and so when, did, when you started to, uh, kind of develop into, you know, uh, more of the independent music stuff and started to develop your identity, uh, in context of that, was that kind of in high school, like when you were in, in Florida or had you been, you know, privy to that a, a few years prior via some other connection? It actually started really young, unbelievably, like even dating back to when I first moved from Virginia, cause DC was just so rich mm-hmm. and obviously influential, what would later be, you know, alternative music, I guess, through, through the roots of punk rock and indie rock. But, um, I had, uh, I skateboarded and I remember just having some friends who were listening to music that we introduced me to some music, even dating back to when I was like 10, 11 years old. Wow. That, uh, was obviously not the norm of anything on the radio or, or what have you. And so, uh, I actually got, he, he, um, introduced to some bands who are still to this day influential to me that were DC centered in the, uh, at that point, the, uh, the punk rock scene there. And so, yeah, at a pretty much young age, um, I was listening to different kinds of music than what your parents would listen to or what you would just come across on the radio. Right. What stuff? So yeah, it actually dates back further than that. So that's awesome. What, what, what stuff was, uh, were they putting in your brain at that time? Well, it's funny you mentioned brains because that would be the bad brains. Right. <laughs> uh, one band in particular who I developed a love for, uh, through my friends who introduced me to it at the time, even as young as I was. Um, there in the, uh, in the, uh, um, early eighties. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, the DC scene at that point, obviously discord records was prevalent as far as underground stuff went. So, you know, like minor threat and bad brains and, um, you know, bands like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I sort of was introduced to and thought, you know, and obviously just the whole culture skateboarding and that kind of thing. Uh, um, I guess you could say sort of pop these kind of groups up Yep. <clears throat> that, uh, the, you know, the group of people, the peer group I happen to be with were, were listening to. But then I also like New Wave, like Talking Heads, Big Pocket Heads fan. And, you know, certain things you would hear on the radio, obviously classic rock. <laughs> I loved it all. Like, it's funny, going through school, you know, I, well, you're 35, so you're probably old enough to remember. Going through school, you know, you, you'd have a feature going to, like, high school or junior high where there was different groups of people, and it seemed like the social groups were almost predicated on the music they listened to. Mm-hmm. Like, you'd have preps, and then you'd have burnouts, and then you'd have, like, punk rockers, and, you know, or people in the hip hop or what have you. And it seemed like, uh, a lot of times people sort of were pigeonholed into certain groups of people and they, they seem to have a similarity even with the music they listened to. Not so much anymore, but back when we were growing up. But with me, I was even a chameleon back then. I had like a lot of different friends who were sort of, you could sort of visually put them in a, in a certain group of a peer group. And I was just sort of this guy that was floating around. I, I almost call like a nickname would be Casey Jones, like from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or sure. just a guy coming out of the wilderness, trying to sort of take things from different groups and experience and listen to different kinds of music. So, I, I mean, I was all over the place with music. I mean, everything from Michael Jackson to, you know, to Talking Heads to, you know, what have you. So. Yeah, well, I, I, it's funny you mentioned that because I was actually going to make a correlation a little bit later on in regards to, um, uh, you know, whatever, connecting, obviously, the, your, your deep passion for video games and obviously the, the connection to, you know, punk rock and hardcore, where it's like the I, I like that notion. Uh, and I always feel that people are more, I guess, well-rounded when they do bounce between different you know groups of people where it's like yeah i am friends with a football player and they may have introduced me to some things that i might not have been introduced if i just stuck to my you know skater or punk friends or whatever um so it's funny that you mentioned that because i i was actually going to peg you as such later so there you go i was playing a little armchair psychologist before well it's funny because video games were a big part of my life too around that period of time when there was arcade obviously and right. that was a big social hangout spot where arcades because i mean when you go to an arcade in the, in the 80s you know, you're meeting new people, you're discovering new games as they come out. It was like a nice, you know, sort of a, sort of an escape between school and going home, you know, a place to go where you can meet other people your age, actually be doing something, playing a game, and then just hanging out and, you know, uh, meeting new people. So it's definitely arcades were a big part 
along with skateboarding or, or hanging out with uh, with kids at that point in time. So yeah, no, it's cool because it, like I, like I said, it does give you a more well rounded view of the world when you are getting these different influences popping into who you are. Um, right. The uh, it, it kind of you know really focusing in on your 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 drumming and obviously the fact that uh, you're. Your style of drumming um, is incredibly unique in the fact that um, it's very frantic and technical um, and definitely never something that I would be like, hey, if you're just learning drums, like, go ahead and watch Steve play because, like, you you know, you're, uh, like I said, you're a very technical drummer. Um, Do you attribute that to anything, like, in regards to um, just kind of what you were initially interested in as far as drums is concerned? Or was that just, like, a function of the people you were playing with? Yeah, I think it, it, it was, uh, I think part of it makes, it's not forced. It's just naturally what comes out of me sometimes, the way I tend to write. I guess some people would view it as unorthodox. Um, definitely a part of it is the, the second uh, option B, like you said, as far as the people that you write with. I mean, especially when it comes to the, the initial bands that you know me to, to be a part of. Mm-hmm. Those guys are just tremendous in their creativity and their approach to writing even guitar and bass. And so it's sort of naturally, uh, naturally connected with my mind, the way I approach, you know, writing, writing uh, drum parts or doing drum stuff. But no, I mean, I, I mean, I listened to a lot of basic straight ahead stuff, obviously when I was younger. And, uh, I mean, I've been playing drums most of my life. I mean, it dates back to, according to my parents, which I don't even remember when I was four years old. And uh, my parents tell me the story. Like I said, I, I don't remember it, <clears throat> but where they took me to a, a friend's of theirs house and a drum set was set up. And next thing they knew, I just got up and started playing a beat naturally and had never been on a drum set before. So they sort of just like, oh, we know what he's going to do, and, right. you know, to some extent. And uh, I guess everybody was freaked out by it as far as, you know, my parents and their friends at the time. Like, how is he knowing to even play a beat kind of thing? Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> that, that so. My love and my uh, activity or of uh, playing drums dates back to that far. But, yeah, I would say it's probably more of a product of people I happen to write with, e- even dating back before Strong Arm and Shy Lude and further to the early bands I set. Mm-hmm. Those guys were visionaries as well, I thought, musically. It's like they're influenced. I think it's just a product. You're influenced by a lot of different things. <clears throat> And uh, on top of that, what naturally is coming out of you um, happened to merge into a very unique kind of approach to uh, to uh, to uh, the framework of songs and the direction and the transition and movement of them. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Let me tell you, the holidays are awesome. They've got some great moments, whether it's spending time with friends and family, gift giving, all of the things I personally love. Christmas lights, like I can't wait to put them up. It just makes me feel warm inside. But there are moments where it's like, man, it's overwhelming, or I'm feeling really alone or sad. All of the things that just, you know, can kind of compound it during the holidays. That is why you need to take a beat and maybe take that moment for yourself. Give the gift of time to yourself. And that's honestly why I love dipping into therapy. That's why I also love working with BetterHelp because they make finding a therapist online so dang easy. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Like I said, it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and then you get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for any reason at no additional charge. Please, in this season of giving, give to yourself as well with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Ray to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Ray for 10% off your first month. Take care of yourself, please. This episode is brought to you by Toyota. We all agree that reducing carbon emissions is a good thing. And once again, Toyota is leading the way. We hear a lot about fully electric vehicles, and Toyota has them with more on the way. But we also know a BEV is not for everyone, whether it's because of cost, range, or concerns about finding a charging station when you need it. Plus, the raw materials used to manufacture batteries are limited. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon-neutral future, in vehicles and in manufacturing plants, too, in the years ahead. 
The materials used to make just one long-range battery for an EV could be used to make batteries for six plug-in hybrids or 90 gas-electric hybrids. That's why Toyota's position today is electrified, diversified, empowering you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint with the vehicle that's right for you. A hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery EV. So shop, learn more, and get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. Hello there. This is Malcolm Gladwell, host of Revisionist History. eBay Motors is here for the ride. You saw the potential. Through some elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love, you transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive entirely its own. Look to your left, look to your right. No one's got a ride like this. There's nothing else that sounds like, feels like, or looks like the set of wheels in your garage. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly so there's no limit to how far you can take it. Brake kits, turbochargers, engines, exhaust kits, roof racks, LED headlights, bumpers, Whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, for your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. So, Right, yeah. No, it, it, make, it, it definitely makes sense. Like, yeah, if you start off playing really technical stuff like that's kind of the direction you're going to go you're not going to want to you know reverse and all of a sudden just be like oh yeah i just want to play a simple two you know two four beat like that's all <laughs> or four four beat right um, well there is a time and a place i mean if there it fits is. naturally then then you know I'm, I'm all for it but then if something you know is written where it's just like in that like in other words there, i feel sometimes like like the term technical or what have you it's 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 better when it's natural and not like forced just to try to fit something in. Right. You know, if it's just naturally comes off that way, then I think that's beautiful. I think that's awesome. Right. Yeah. You don't want to, um, you don't want to overly complicate something for just being the fact that like, yo, look how awesome this fill is. I'm just going to blow it. Like mind. overkill it. Yeah. Or something or, or do something where it's taking the onus away from the center of everybody playing at the same time. Like the, like almost like the center of gravity of the song. Yep. <clears throat> you know, like what you don't want it to, you know, you don't want to, to listen back to a song and it's just like, you know, one aspect or, or one leg of the, of the ensemble is like sort of overpowering everybody else. Like it sort of has to be a, a formula or a recipe that it's it sort of all, you know, all these moving parts, but somehow there's a formula to it. It's, it's right. You mm-hmm. know, or it's, it's all sort of working together instead of, you know, one part overshadowing another because of the, the busyness of it or something. Sure. It's like you, you put way too much pepper in that one. Like, yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and so, I mean, it, from the way that you're, you're speaking about it um, in regards to your, your, your drum playing and the fact that you obviously moved to join strong arm, it sounded like you had some, uh, I guess, a- ambitions to obviously like make music for a living. Um, even though obviously at that particular time, that wasn't even really, uh, a possibility within our within our world, the punk and hardcore world. Um, but did was that just a, an in, instinct you just had to follow? Well, I'll tell you what. At the time, especially with that genre of music, you know, if you're being offered like a record deal from an actual record label who's actually going to make a physical product like a CD, just that in itself was a big deal. You know, back then, you know, if you have a band contacting you, hey, this is our deal. We got signed by a record label. We're going to be touring, you know, for an extended period of time. We're going to have a physical product to sell. There's money potentially to be made. You know, you sort of jump on that if you're used to just playing in bands that just play around town, you know, or that just do local stuff and, you know, don't really ever go anywhere. So at the time, when I, you know, first and foremost, I was friends with all of them. So it'd just be awesome to play together with people who you love being around and love sharing life and experiences with. But then on top of that, they had an opportunity strong arm when they got signed to, uh, at the time tooth and nail to, uh, actually broaden the horizons of what any of us knew at that point. Wow. You mean it's possible to go on a tour or it's almost like a scene in that thing you do. Remember the movie, that thing you do. Exactly. Of course. <laughs> With, uh, Tom Hanks as the manager of the band. And, you know, they're just so used to playing like talent shows or something. And then all of a sudden 
so, you know, somebody or their music caught somebody's ear and then they're getting presented this opportunity that's foreign to them where they're like, wow, okay. Right. You know, that's, it was sort of that kind of vibe. They, they presented me this, you know, this is what we're doing. We're going to be busy. We're going to be active. You know, you want to be a part of this. I'm like, of course, it'd be definitely a dream is to, in any capacity, to be able to do what you love to do. Um, as far as I'm concerned, is a career as opposed to a job, <clears throat> even though everything feels like a job, you know, sometimes, but because of the work that you have to put in leading up to that one hour, hour and a half of glory of just being able to perform for people. Right. You know, there's a lot of work that goes into it with traveling and loading in and setting up and, and uh, keeping track of stuff and all those things, you know, can feel like a job sometimes, but the pure performance, knowing that you're, knowing that people are showing up to, pay money to listen and, and, and view what you've created is something that should never be taken for granted. So no matter how many people there are. Yep. Oh, you know? of course. Ten, so, I mean, 10 or a hundred, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so at the time, yeah, it was one of those things where, wow, these guys, you know, are really got, they're doing you know, are in a position, they're doing something and they're active and they're, you know, plus, you know, if you like to travel and you, I can't think of a better way to, to see the world, to see the country side than, you know, at least getting paid something to do it and, and do what you love to do on top of that. So it was sort of like a, um, all systems go like a perfect storm of get to hang out with friends, get to play music that we're making and, you know, get, get a product out there that we can present to people and, you know, and then from there they can present to people and what have you. So yeah, it is definitely more of a, an opportunity that we were like, wow, let's, uh, let's try, know, this. try to take advantage of this. Right. <clears throat> um, and it, the, like, obviously when advent of, when advent of a miracle came out, um, it, was it, uh, j- it, part, pardon me asking this question. Cause it seems like so basic, but just like, you know, was the record well received because, you know, I, I felt like I got into it and by that time you guys had already, you know, kind of disbanded or moved on. Um, and so I, I, I didn't get a general perspective of how that record sort of impacted it initially. I know obviously where it sits now, um, but was there a, a very high level of enthusiasm once you guys started to play out or was it kind of met just like, okay, well that, that was a good record way to go. Right. Um, I guess it probably, I'm sorry, I'm making noise here. It's all right. I guess it would depend on who you talk to or where we went. I mean, there was obviously, you know, certain areas that were, we would come across people who were more enthusiastic about it than other areas we would play or, or what have you. I mean, since we, we put out a, you know, atonement, obviously, and then the second record, I'm trying to remember back to be honest with you, but yeah, I, I guess there was a sense of anticipation and a sense of people were ready to, see what we were going to offer next kind of thing, <clears throat> at least within that scene of music. So, uh, yeah, I would say that it was, uh, it was well received and, um, you know, we, we did some, uh, we did a couple tours off of it. Um, probably didn't tour on it as much as we wanted to right. just by typical virtue of, you know, you get five guys in a band, motivation levels will wane, you know, priorities to other stuff takes over and you're just not able to do as much, uh, touring or whatever, maybe one person would like to, as opposed to another. So, but, um, usually we would tour in the summer. If I, if I remember correctly regarding that album. <clears throat> and I know, like, I know we did a tour with overcome at the time off that for that, for Advent. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure we did. And then, um, we did a tour with Zayo and, uh, as far as out your way, I remember playing with focal point and like bands like that. Right. Um, periodically. And then, um, so yeah, I would say it was, uh, it was, there was some, in, there was definitely a, a spirit of anticipation to see, uh, what we were going to, uh, how we were going to top or match, uh, what people had come to love regarding atonement. And they really are, I mean, there, there's aspects as far as the, the guitar and the, the melodies and the movement, I guess, that are similarities, but I consider Advent to be definitely, uh, somewhat of a different album than atonement. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you're for a person trying to listen to strong arm. It's not like you're going, the first listen is going to be atonement. You're going to present advent of a miracle in order to uh, steer them in the right direction. Um, gotcha. Okay, the, well, yeah, there you go. Good <laughs> least, to know. I, least, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. Come on. You, it's, it's not like you want to be, especially if you're presenting it to a younger person, it's not like you want to be like, Oh dude, check out a, you know, check out the trial seven inch. It's like, no, you, you, go, you go to the, the best product in my opinion. Um, but okay. the, gotcha. um, 
and, and so like a, as you uh it, well sorry just collecting my thoughts one last thing in regards sure. to strong arm where the the record like you were mentioning a little bit earlier um was I, I can still listen to this day and the record is is so goddamn loud like it is really really loud and like obviously that is what um, can kind of make a record, you know, a little bit more timeless where it's not like, you know, a lot of the mid nineties and even late nineties, hardcore bands, um, you know, you can listen to whatever a chokehold recording and be like, Oh my God, like, it sounds like they're throwing trash cans down uh, a hallway, you know? Um, whereas, <laughs> whereas this record, it, it's definitely more, uh, more polished. Um, I presume that was, v- that was very intentional from you guys to obviously have a very, uh, I guess, high quality recording and not just kind of be like, Oh, let's record it with our buddy down the street and that sort of stuff. Right. Oh, well, you know what? For Advent of a Miracle, we actually did record it in a pretty nice studio at the time with like a professional board. And, and the, I remember the engineer, I believe was a guy named Jeremy Stoska. And, um, I guess the budget, I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, now it would sound like a nothing budget, but I guess back then maybe it's a good enough budget for us to pull off going into a nice place and making a, uh, a professional style recording of the music so you can actually make out everything. I know what you're saying. I mean, there's there's actually timeless hardcore records where the the recording itself is terrible, right? But the song, but the songs are great, and, and you know, if it's discernible enough for for it to grab you and want to see the band live, you know, exactly. But um, <clears throat> yeah, with the advent of a miracle, it definitely was in a in a big, um, renowned recording studio that was here in South Florida. I don't even know if it's around anymore, and I, I'm trying to even remember the name of the studio. But I remember, yeah, it was definitely like, I remember us going in like, oh, wow, this is like for real. <laughs> it was like a really nice studio. And, you know, the, the, ironically, though, I will say there, to this day, you know, if we listen to it, uh, now it got remastered, I think. I think Solid State or Tooth and Nail wound up remastering the Advent maybe a couple of years back. Yep. But uh, it's where it even sounds better now. But it's funny how you mentioned, you know, it's some of the stuff's hard. There are actually parts that we felt even based on the conditions of being in a nice studio that it, it's funny you said loud because there's certain parts where I actually wished in listening back would have been more discernible or I would have actually been louder. Like a couple of different songs where like Josh had a really nice sort of high guitar part and it's sort of really, really low in the mix as opposed to everything else going on. Mm-hmm. So ironically, we actually thought at least the mixing of it, maybe not the recording, but the mixing of it could have been better. Um, and hence it did get remastered down the road. But, right. but yeah, I will say that we had access to a studio that probably most bands in that genre of music at that point in time probably did not have access to to, to make a, a, a quality recording. Right. right. Yeah, that definitely. And uh, yeah, like you said, that that definitely uh, helps a record live on a little bit longer um, and n- not just be kind of like forgotten to those, you know, those few years of where it's like, oh, yeah, like you said, the the spirit of the song is there and the song is good, but uh, it's almost right, inaudible. Right. it's almost inaudible. You are now entering the Bad Christian Podcast. What's up, jerks? My name is Matt Carter, and I'm from the Bad Christian Podcast. Yeah, that's me and Toby. Toby and I are from the band Emery, and then our friend Joey, who is a pastor, believe it or not. And what we do on our podcast is, let's see, well, we shoot the shit, um, we talk about bullshit, and then the rest of the time I think we're full of shit. So the key word about our podcast is shit. And don't let the name fool you. Well, I guess you could let the name fool you. I don't know what the name really means. But we're the Bad Christian Podcast, and you can check us out. Find us on iTunes and wherever else. As you started to, obviously, you know, play in Shai Lude and start to become, uh, you know, more active, because there definitely was a lot of uh, heat and attention placed on Shai Lude once you guys started to, you know, release your your first stuff as far as, like, just with the affiliation of Revelation and everything like that. And obviously, <laughs> Rob, Rob Moran bringing you into Crisis Records and stuff like that. Um was it, uh, you know, was it exciting for you to kind of feel like you could go from sort of one thing to another, so to speak, where it's like, okay, like, well, strong arm is ending and that's, that's that, but I have this other thing that has a lot of excitement too. Like, was it, uh, did you feel like you were onto something, I guess? <clears throat> well, it's funny. Shia Lou got brought about because they actually needed a drummer temporarily because since I was still active with strong arm and strong arm was my first priority. <clears throat> um, it was one of those things where, Shilu, the original drummer was a guy named Jason Letterman, who's a great drummer, good friend. Uh, he's played, I think he played in the AAA as well, against all authority, um, for some time. But, um, 
you know, they, they were in need of a drummer. And originally I was only supposed to be like a fill-in guy. Like I was only going to play, you know, maybe a couple shows or just fill in until they got someone. And then it just, you know, it just kept evolving to where they just wanted me to, to be the drummer. And so I was like, well, it was a little bit of a juggling act at the time. I mean, initially, because obviously my commitment's a strong arm <clears throat> and what Shiloh wanted to do in the sense of touring weren't on the same page all the time until we actually did tour together, which was then it was a perfect storm. But, um, but yeah, no, Shiloh was, a, I, I loved, you know, the writing from, uh, Matt Fox at the time, or obviously as an original member of that band, pretty much the brain of it. Um, just as much as Josh, I mean, he just, what these guys were writing was just blowing my mind. I was just like, wow, this is such great quality, like just melodic and, um, transitional. And it just sort of took to me quite naturally, quite easily for me. And then, you know, they would probably say the same thing on my accord, which what I brought to the table, it just really meshed well with what they were doing and what they were writing with at the time. And so, yeah, Shia Lude was one of those things where I wasn't, I was sort of just doing it to help out. And then it just sort of, they just never looked for anybody else for a while. And, and then strong arms started to uh, sort of get a little more, not as um, active on the touring end. And then at that time, it, it freed up Shia Lude when I was still with them. And obviously, with Chad Gilbert singing on um, that lineup, um, we were uh, we were able to do our start doing our own thing and start you know spreading our wings and being able to do more touring as a result of uh, Strong Arm being a little more limited in in, in uh, what they were able to what they were available, I should say, to do right. as far as touring goes. So yeah, it was an interesting kind of you know eased in and then sort of took over. <clears throat> with that band so i almost like passing the baton yeah that's and awesome. then i uh, continued continuing on with the halud for a while until about like i said until about 98 right and then at that point is when uh the strong arm guys sort of came back came back a column with, with all kinds of new music that was not hardcore or metal or anything and you know at that point uh i was at the point as well where i wanted to start playing different stuff and mm not just such aggressive stuff all the time. Right. And so, uh, and hence, uh, you know, I wound up, uh, eventually leaving Shia Lude and, and, uh, focusing more on what would become further seems forever. But sure. in saying that me, me and Matt Fox are the best of friends. We talk all the time, I still offer ideas to him and he still shows me stuff and ideas he's working on all the time. And it's always great. You know, he's always, you know, such a awesome creator. Absolutely. And, uh, and writer. So, I mean, I, I almost look forward to it because I know whatever he's going to show me, I'm probably going to like, so. Oh yeah. He's, um, he, he, he's, yeah. A, he's, a, he's a crazy individual, but he's such an endearingly amazing individual as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> the, um, and so, you know, obviously as you were existing in this world and start, and becoming, you know, really active and touring and all that sort of stuff, how did, how did that sit with your parents? Like, were they ever like, oh my gosh, like Steve is going down this path that we'll never be able to get him out of. Like, uh, you know, he's throwing his life away. Like this, uh, he needs to have a plan B. Like were any of those conversations happening or is any, you know, turmoil or strife within the, con uh, the confines of your home? Okay. Um, my parents were always supportive of, uh, anything music prowess that I did because my dad originally was a rock and roll singer himself. Um, oh, he actually really? put out a 40, yeah, oh. 45 okay. way back in the day. And my mom was very artistically inclined too, based on, you know, she was from South Bronx, New York and sort of what you would consider a beatnik when she was a, a teenager and, you know, very artsy and culture, a lot of culture and arts and music. And so, you know, they were always, they were never, um, they've always been supportive of, any kind of endeavors musically that, uh, <clears throat> that I wanted to take on, you know, they got me a drum set, uh, relatively young, you know, I would practice within reason, of course, um, noise wise, um, when it was allowed to or what have you, but, but yeah, I never had any kind of a situation where they were trying to steer me like not to do something or, Oh, uh, you know, you, you're going to go nowhere if you do that, like that kind of thing. Like they were always like, you know, go for it, do what you love. And uh, I do respect them obviously we'll always respect them for that. I'm, I guess one of the maybe rare people, unfortunately in this day and age where I have parent, two parents who are still together. Yeah. So they're, they'll actually be celebrating their, their 50th winning anniversary this week. Oh, that's, that's, so, a, um, that, that's a, that's a piece of work right there. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I know it is. It's definitely miraculous. Obviously, you know, everybody goes through rough times. They, yep. you know, 
been through some rough times throughout the course of my life, but they, you know, they always worked at it and made an effort and kept it going, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, I always respect and cherish them for that. And, and that sort of goes along with the whole spirit of just, you know, do what you love and, you know, do what you can. So, right. so yeah. yeah, definitely never had an issue where parents were sort of poo-pooing me to sort of, uh, go after, uh, uh, um, aspirations musically. Sure. Absolutely. That's incredible. Um, and so then, I, I mean, I definitely uh, distinctly remember uh, once uh, further, obviously, signed to Tisha Nail and like that, that, that uh, the news of this, this band existing um, was, was exciting where it's just like, oh yeah, it's like a dudes in strong arm playing like emo music. Like that is 100% what I remember someone <laughs> describing, <laughs> describing to me like, oh, that's probably, I can what, believe it. Yeah. That's probably what this record will sound like. And then I remember once moon, the, the moon is down hit. It was one of those things where um, there were very uh, records of that time definitely hit in really big ways because like, I mean, I remember, you know, another band from your area. It's like when poison, the well released opposite of December, it was like, you could not talk to a hardcore kid or a punk kid that hadn't heard that record. Everybody was listening to it. And I, I felt the same way about the moon is down. It's like, everybody was listening to it. No matter if you were like, you know, a tough guy, <laughs> mad ball, loving hardcore person, like you would right, still be like, right. yeah, dude, moon is down. Moon is down. It's a pretty good record. Um, did you get, did you feel that momentum pretty quickly, uh, in regards to just the attention that was paid to you or, or did it feel like a more gradual build? You know, it's funny you mentioned, but the, uh, we always had a saying that, you know, Further Seems Forever is the band that hardcore kids' girlfriends listen to. Of course. <laughs> totally, dude. <laughs> Sorry, just jokingly. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it seemed to, uh, I don't think we realized quite an impact that album had until maybe later down the road or even up to now, you know, and doing it and just hearing from people periodically of how much the album meant to them or how much of an influence it was. And I know we loved what we wrote at the time. And, we, and uh, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, even the whole record itself was sort of finished last minute. Um, because at the time, um, Chris was, he was doing dashboard, but it was like more of a side project. And even some tours we did, he would sort of do sort of a side show of, of just him with an acoustic. And that's what dashboard was. And, uh, but it was a side gig, whereas further was the main thing. And then when it got to the point where I guess the guys were sort of questioning how much we were going to tour, um, with what we were writing and Chris at that point's mindset was completely gung ho, like obviously doing it as much as possible, which I respected him for because I also was under the same mindset, but some of the other guys at the time, you know, already had families and different stuff going on to where they probably couldn't be as committal as maybe me and Chris could be on the touring end. And so I think that sort of naturally sort of led to Chris sort of, uh, uh, going with, uh, focusing more on doing dashboard, um, because he was in control of everything. He wrote everything. Mm-hmm. And so he could do it whenever he wanted to. And then, uh, you know, as a result, like the moon is down album was actually, if I'm, if I remember correctly, I don't want to try to think like the, the music was recorded. And then I think Chris later did the vocals. Oh yeah. I, de- um, I definitely remember, so... I definitely remember word coming out where it was just like, cause obviously like there was a, a, a large level of confusion within the independent music community of just like, Oh, this dude's doing dashboard. But then he's saying on this record, like, I don't know what that actually means. Cause of course, like, again, the internet was still in its infancy. So no one really had the ease of access to information. Right. So, um, but yeah, I, I do definitely remember hearing that where it was like, Oh yeah. Like Chris, contributed to this record, but like this can't be his full-time thing because he's focusing on dashboard or whatever. Right. Well, that was mainly, that was partly because of us. Like six, we were like, well, not me per se personally, but I mean, it's, he was doing both. And obviously, you know, the music was serious and it was great and it came out great and we were loving it, but we just were a little bit like <clears throat> teeter tottering on how much activity we were going to do touring wise going forward at the time. And, you know, Chris was ready to, to to hit the road and, and get out there and, and do it. And so, uh, as a result, you know, he took dashboard at that point as more of his focus and, um, but to his credit, of course, as well, he wanted to fulfill all those commitments that we had already started. Mm-hmm. And of course the big, one of the biggest one being finishing this album, right. which became the moon is down. And so, uh, so yeah, like for instance, new desert life. I mean, that one was literally done in the studio that song with which we love that song. In fact, the last song on the record, it was about as organic and spontaneous as you can imagine, as far as trying to, you know, write one more song for a record, <clears throat> you know, it wasn't something that we had already been working on and already had written a long time ago. And now we're just executing it in the studio. This is something that everything happened for it in the studio. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, maybe there were some parts of ideas that were that were already sort of we were festering on, but it came together as a song in the studio, actually. Nice. That's a and good then, uh, and then and then the same with Chris. You know, on the vocal end, it was something where he didn't really, you know, um, like he had lyrics already in place for some of the songs, but then New Desert Life sort of just, much like mu- music-wise, came to us as a revelation in a way. It sort of came to him as well in the most, like, spontaneous, organic way. Right. <laughs> and um, This episode is brought to you by Toyota. We all agree that reducing carbon emissions is a good thing, and once again, Toyota is leading the way. We hear a lot about fully electric vehicles, and Toyota has them, with more on the way. But we also know a BEV is not for everyone, whether it's because of cost, range, or concerns about finding a charging station when you need it. Plus, the raw materials used to manufacture batteries are limited. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon-neutral future, in vehicles and in manufacturing plants, too, in the years ahead. The materials used to make just one long-range battery for an EV could be used to make batteries for six plug-in hybrids or 90 gas-electric hybrids. That's why Toyota's position today is electrified, diversified, empowering you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint with the vehicle that's right for you, a hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery EV. So shop, learn more, and get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. Hello there. This is Malcolm Gladwell, host of Revisionist History. eBay Motors is here for the ride. You saw the potential. Through some elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love, you transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive entirely its own. Look to your left, look to your right. No one's got a ride like this. There's nothing else that sounds like, feels like, or looks like the set of wheels in your garage. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly so there's no limit to how far you can take it. Brake kits, turbochargers, engines, exhaust kits, roof racks, LED headlights, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. My mental health meds were helping, but they led to uncontrolled movements called TD, tardive dyskinesia. It felt like my movements were in the spotlight. Ingreza Valbenazine Capsules is a prescription medicine for adults with TD. It's the only TD treatment that's always one pill, once daily, and it's number one prescribed. And people taking Ingreza can stay on most mental health meds. Ingreza can cause depression, suicidal thoughts, or actions in patients with Huntington's disease. Pay close attention to and call your doctor if you become depressed, have sudden changes in mood, behaviors, feelings, or have thoughts of suicide. Don't take Ingreza if you're allergic to its ingredients. Ingreza may cause serious side effects, including angioedema, potential heart rhythm problems, and abnormal movements. Report fevers, stiff muscles, or problems thinking, as these may be life-threatening. Sleepiness is the most common side effect. Now that treatment has reduced my TD movements, it's nice. People focus more on me. Ask your doctor about Ingreza or learn more at Ingreza.com. That's I-N-G-R-E-Z-Z-A.com. That, that's awesome. I'm sorry, I mean, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, that, that that's awesome. And I, I definitely remember, too, where it's like when you guys released that 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 split with Recess Theory, um, it already had kind of, um, you know, started to pay, obviously pave the way for the excitement that led up to to the record because there was that that um, initial music out there that was really, really strong. And obviously you guys used you guys used all three of those songs for the full length, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, no, well, might, uh, two be, of them. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, two out of three. Um, Justice, Justice Prevails is only on the from the twenty seventh state EP. However, there is um, in between, I believe, um, maybe just until sundown and wearing thin. There's sort of a little fodder in the middle. It's like sort of a a radio broadcast, and ironically, it's like somebody trying to tune in a radio station. That's the uh, the effect we wanted to give it with yeah. our engineer. And then you can hear Justice Prevails, almost right. like staticky in the background. Right. Like just a part of it really quick before the next song actually came in. 
And so I guess technically it is on in this town, but just a just an excerpt from it from a radio frequency. You know? Totally, that was a, that's, that's what comedians call a callback. Or it's like obviously it's like hey, you know, if you guys listen to the the first EP we put out, like here, here's a little uh, fan trivia for you. <laughs> right. Uh, um, and then obviously, uh, I mean, the only, the only reason I'm not, I'm not, uh, belaboring a lot of, uh, the, the records, uh, that you did sense is because, you know, a lot of that has been pretty well documented and a lot, a lot of people have asked a lot of different questions about it. Um, so obviously that's why I'm trying to kind of shine a light on, on these different topics. Um, sure. the, and so then, uh, obviously as, you know, further seems forever was always in, in bouts of activity and inactivity. Um, was it one of those things where... <clears throat> Were you were you ever kind of uh, I guess you know maybe frustrated on the fact that obviously you couldn't um, you know do that from a all right like I'm gonna tour nine months out of the year perspective um, or did you find it I guess helpful for your own um, you know well being the fact that you could kind of duck in and out of touring um, when it made sense and obviously when everyone was on the same page um, or did you feel at certain points it was kind of limiting. Yeah, no, I definitely felt limited and frustrated as well because the problem is when you have five people in the band getting everybody's motivation level to be, uh, uh, as a team to do everything and anything you can to, for the pro, for the, for the sake of, if you actually are trying to make a living doing it, um, it was definitely frustrating at times. Now in saying that it was a double edged sword. I mean, it was also good at times to not burn out and just sort of take a break and, you know, take care and do other things and then come back to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, we always had, a. um, an interesting um, situation with that because like our main guitarist, Josh Colbert, who what wrote a lot of the, you know, most of the stuff musically, um, he never toured really. Um, just didn't really have, a, his desire was more writing and being in the studio and not really traveling as much. Mm-hmm. I mean, part of that obviously is having a family and wanting to be there for his family at all times. Um, especially in, you know, the growing up stages of his son, for instance. But uh, give me one second. I'm sorry. No problem. I'm just going to shut that off. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely, I mean, I'd say the How to Start a Fire era of Further was definitely when we were the most active. I mean, we definitely found ourselves for, I'd say, between the years of 2001 to 2005, probably touring six, seven months out of the year. But with our band, even from the inception, most everybody was either married or in a relationship. So the way we tried to work it out, as opposed to a lot of bands who whose management would dictate that they stay out for a whole year or two years or something and just do everything and anything. For us, we usually try to cater to maybe going out for four to six weeks maximum and then coming home for a month or two and then going back out for three weeks and then coming. And we try to tailor it to where, you know, we weren't gone for too long in respect to our families and yet still be active enough to make a living doing it. So it was definitely a, you know, a balancing act. And I would say the How to Start a Fire years is when we were definitely the most active and, you know, legitimately, you know, doing it for a living for a period of time, you know, having music videos out and airplay here and there and then being on the road and getting on some high profile tours to support and then headlining runs to, uh, to, uh, to grow with. So, right. but yeah, no, it definitely was, uh, for me personally, now it depends who you talk to, of course. With me, it was, you know, I was sort of more of the spirit of like Chris, even with the Moon is Down era where, you know, I wanted to do everything and anything. I just love to travel and I love to play. <clears throat> but then, of course, you know, through no fault of, I mean, other guys just had more priorities. You know, they had different priorities. And right. They had different different family or things going on in their life that they they had to be there for, and you know, rightfully so in a lot in a lot of uh, cases. So, um, so I understand it. In reflecting back, you know, I think we could have done so much more. You know, beside, you know, in the way of touring, if we would have uh, sort of, you know, put the pedal to the metal for a couple of years there in our height. But, you know, in saying that, we had to find a fill-in guitarist most of the time uh, to fill in for Josh. And then, um, you know, just, I mean, nobody's fault, of course. It's just that's the way it goes. You know, it's like you're in a group of people where you love playing, but you got other stuff going on in your life that takes priority. And you can just, you know, you can only do what you can do. <clears throat> um, when the schedules align. Right. Exactly. And uh, that's pretty much the way further has been. And, and when it comes to the, the touring side of the group, 
Right. Sure. Well, I mean, it makes total sense. Like people have adult, adult responsibilities and not everybody can, uh, can skirt those things off. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, we, you, you're correct. Obviously it's like that era of the band was obviously the most, um, you know, active and prolific where you guys were out there. Um, and I, I just think, I mean, it, to me, one of the most charming things about Further Seeps Forever, and I don't mean charming in like a sort of, you know, belittling sense, but it's just the fact that uh, there are very few bands that obviously could have three distinctly different vocalists from completely different walks of life. Um, I mean, when I say walks of life, I mean <coughs> life experiences. Um, they obviously all are connected within the independent music scene. Um, but the, the fact that like, I mean, realistically, I'm not trying to blow, blow smoke up your ass. All the records are really, really good. Like, and that's a that's a really hard thing to do especially you're changing the identity every single record um as far as the vocalist is concerned um is it one of those things where you 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 find it almost um uh i wouldn't even say comical but just like wow like our 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 fans have really stuck beside us because in all reality they shouldn't have followed us along all of these changes that we've done right i think that's the end result actually like now right um, now that there's been some time separated from some of these albums that when they first came out, I think it seems to be, and obviously with unfortunate events like John's passing recently, it sucks that it takes an event like that maybe to have people sort of revisit something that they may not have liked initially. Mm-hmm. And then they revisit it and they're like, wow, this was, this really was good. And at the time, maybe I had other vices toward the band or where they personalized the band based on one particular singer. And so they wouldn't give anybody else a chance kind of thing. So, I mean, I don't, you know, we had a lot of critical acclaim at the time that these records came out. And there was always, you know, people, that, you know, your typical historical, oh, I like the old star, you know, I like, you know, the old singer, you know, didn't really give a chance to embrace, you know, whoever the new guy was. But, I mean, I will say, um, summarizing to now, yeah, it is sort of interesting how we, I mean, at least for us, first and foremost, what we feel about the music, maybe luck is part of it because, yeah, like you said, it's, it's three definitive different approaches. Um, not necessarily to the music, but definitely to the vocals. Right. Um, and so I think people can, um, hold on one second. All right. Yeah. We, we'll, we'll catch up. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just going out. Um, we, um, like I said, you know, Jason being the second guy, he had a lot of pressure heaped on him to live up to Chris's, you know, to fill Chris's shoes. And then John being the third singer, I mean, to be honest with you, it was really rough. I mean, uh, when, when Hide Nothing first came out, I mean, I would say we probably, um, <clears throat> what's the right word I want to say? We received a new legion, I don't know if legion's the right word, I, I'm getting tongue tied on words right here. Sure. A new quadrant of listeners that did that maybe were Sensefield fans or like probably older listeners Absolutely. we acquired. But then we had our younger listeners who were look who were unfortunately it wasn't always about the music, but it was about, oh, well Jason and Chris look a certain way and they have tattoos and their stage presence or something like that. Yep. They equated the band more to that than the actual pure, you know, music of it. And so when John came along, you know, he was a tall guy, older looking, definitely looks nothing like Jason or Chris did. You know, I think unfortunately and unfairly, people sort of didn't give that record hide nothing initially or the, or the band a chance at that point. You know, they, but I always heard like a lot of comments like, oh, they've become like a, an adult contemporary band or something where, where we thought the music, we, we thought the music is just naturally evolving. A lot of our younger listeners who are, who are used to visually, seeing a certain image or vibe of what the singer's like. Right. And then they just didn't either didn't give John a chance or didn't understand what he was trying to do. And so ironically, and even with Jason too, you know, when how the start of fire first came out, he always had those people, well, you'll never, you know, I'll never like you as much as Chris or whatever. And you know, that kind of thing. And so I think the two guys after Chris definitely went through periods of time where we had a, a section of our listener base that were not, you know, at least, at least initially not warming up to them or not giving them a chance. But then, you know, it's like I said, maybe at the beginning of our conversation, you know, if you, if you set out to write music that, you know, is, you know, you can listen to it 20 years from now and it won't sound dated. I mean, that, that's really the goal. And I think, you know, now 10, 12 years later, and, and 
unfortunately, through a tragic circumstance that happened recently, you know, I, I can't tell you how many messages I've read through social networks or whatever where people were, like, almost apologetic. Like, I'm so sorry for not giving you guys a chance when this record first came out. Now, you know, <clears throat> hearing about the passing, I sort of go back and listen to it, and wow, this is, like, a lot better than I remembered it. Or this is, like, I, I actually, you know, maybe it just took a different period of time in their life to, to gravitate or, or grab grab hold to what we were trying to do, you know, at that period of time of the band. So, yeah, no, it's, I, I'm really glad you hit on that topic because it, it is a very interesting reflection on how, uh, you are, you were on that particular record bringing in two, these two desperate worlds, um, that wouldn't necessarily, uh, intermix with one another. And it was challenging to a lot of people to kind of, like you said, wrap their heads around it, whether, whether it was your young fans or whether it was, uh, you know, people that were, were coming in from the, you know, reason to believe in Sensefield days and are just like, hey, what, who is this random band that John is singing for? Like, what the hell is this? Um, so, yeah, yeah it's, it's a very important point. I mean, and you guys, you know, did, did your best to cope with that. But, yeah, it was a hard, hard road to hoe, I'm sure. Well, keep in mind, even the circumstances of, you know, hiding nothing where the music had already been written, you know, Jason left sort of abruptly at the time, which has all been reconciled, and we're, obviously we're doing what we're doing now, um, or about to. Um, and John came in literally with music that was already written for somebody else. <clears throat> and it's like only one song had any lyrics to it, which is a song that never really got released on anything huge, you know, as far as an actual album. I think it's on some compilation or um, EP or something, maybe that the Tooth and Nail put out later to get attention to Jason's version of it. <clears throat> it's, it's, it, the song is Bleed on a Hide Nothing that, uh, John just wrote from scratch, not even listening to what Jason did. Mm -hmm. um, so the Hide Nothing record, even more oddly enough, I mean, John's in California. You know, he flies out. He lives with our engineer, James Wisner, for a month, and literally under deadline at the time contractually, and, you know, for a tour we had coming up, and, you know, we had to get this album finished. And John came in and, and you know, as you hear, you know, did probably about as unbelievable a job as anybody could have done under the circumstances of having to learn the music and having to create the vo the lyrics and the vocal harmonies for it in such a short period of time. So even the circumstances of Hide Nothing are very odd and very uh, rare of, you know, how the record was finished. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, and the uh, the last thing I want to hit on was uh, something obviously we alluded to earlier in regards to uh, video gaming and how important of a role it played in your life. And obviously, I I don't think I could have smiled any wider uh, once the <laughs> press started to hit whatever you know two years ago when obviously you uh, you shattered or no, uh, I'll say shattered, but you you now hold the world record for uh, it's uh, forgive me I'm totally blanking on the video game, but. Uh, Mario Brothers. Mario Brothers. So for some reason, I was going to say Donkey Kong, but clearly that's not right. Um, but you'd be close. I'd be close. It's definitely you... in the same family. Oh, well, of course. Um, so, I, but I just love it because I think almost every single byline on a, of whatever press was coming out around that was just like, "Here's this rocker that now holds the record." <laughs> I just I, I found it so funny because everyone obviously was painting <clears throat> you with this brush that was very, um, you know. Uh, probably not the most accurate where it's just like, you know, it sounded like you were playing for some eighties hair metal band or something like that. Um, right. but, uh, so I mean, I, I, I know there's a lot to unwrap here, but just like the, the, the notion of obviously the, a, a lot of people, even still to this day, uh, look at video games as like, oh, that's a, it's a cute thing that, that, you know, people do. And, um, you know, maybe, uh, losers do is they get obviously older and adult like, and they just, you know, are shut ins and don't ever interact with the outside world. Um, what makes it obviously so special to you to be able to, um, you know, just dedicate the time and focus to that sort of stuff um, in regards to obviously pursuing a world record? Because that's not uh, that's not easy to play Mario Brothers for six hours. Right. Um, well, I had a love of games when I was younger, obviously, <clears throat> and then went away from it, obviously, when school and work and you know life, you know, is, is happening and music, obviously, with the paying more focus to that. But really, it came down to a documentary that came out in 2007 called The King of Kong. Yep. And it was about a guy who I'm now good friends with that lives down here in South Florida. His name is Billy Mitchell. And uh, he was the Donkey Kong world record holder for years. And the premise of the film is basically him and a guy from the Pacific Northwest that are, you know, sort of jockeying for the world record in that classic arcade title. But it was directed by a guy named Seth Gordon, who uh, 
a lot of people know in movie and entertainment circles. He also directed the, the first Horrible Bosses movie that came after that, actually. And um, this documentary came out and just sort of caught fire. I don't know, it's just, it was a very popular film, and it was, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm saying this to somebody, you've probably never seen it, but I mean, in essence, it was, uh, it created this sort of retro kind of uprising of people who were my age, men and women, who wanted to rediscover these classic 80s arcade titles and compete for world records on them based on what they saw in the documentary, because the documentary has done so well. And so my band members, ironically, are the ones that introduced me to the film to, to watch it. And they're like, oh, Steve, this is so you. Like, we know you used to be pretty intense playing video games and stuff. And so, you know, I watched the documentary, and it really inspired me. I was just like, you know what? I remember there's a couple games that I, that I remember being really good at. Let me check what the records are with Guinness and Twin Galaxies, which is the arcade division of Guinness. And uh, let me try to sort of emulate what this film was, was portraying with these two guys that were going for the record with Donkey Kong. And sure enough, you know, Mario Brothers, original Mario Brothers, which would be the stand-up classic arcade cabinet before the very popular Super Mario Brothers that would be on the, the Nintendo home systems after that. So it was original Mario Brothers, which is the first time that you see that Luigi and the turtles and the crabs and the pipes. And then there was Miss Pac-Man, which I'm, I'm actually number, number three in the world in Miss Pac-Man currently. But, um, so I knew I was good at these games growing up and I sort of rediscovered them. Uh, much like I said, when, when that documentary came out and I watched it and it really sort of stirred me as apparently like it did a lot of other people. And, uh, it, it made an impression and, you know, much like, you know, everything comes back full circle, music, fashion, you know, clothes, you know, uh, in a retro way sooner or later. And that's really what has happened since that documentary came out, even to now with movies like Pixels that came out a little while ago. And so it's just, it is a love. I, I love games. I mean, I love the classics. I, I steer more toward the classic games than the newer third person shooting and home system type stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, it, it sort of, sort of, um, um, stirred in me a, a passion to sort of re, uh, revisit some of these games and see how I would fare on them. And uh, there's actually sort of an arcade community, not unlike the music community, where there's people that connect all over the country and the world through um, different sites, through Twitch, through Twitch channels. I don't know if you've ever heard of Twitch, but yep, absolutely. I actually have a, I have a Twitch page. It's twitch.tv slash Maximum Steve. And uh, when, I, when I stream, you know, you can watch me from anywhere, like stream some of the classic games and people watch me for tips or to, to get better at that particular game from time to time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, there's this whole arcade community I discovered that I didn't realize was so, you know, there were so many people that were involved with it around the country. And so, yeah, I was, I achieved the world record of January, literally January of last year, uh, 2015. And ever since then, it's, a uh, it's been awesome. I mean, I, I attend like three or four different arcade and pinball expos uh, throughout the year, and, you know, get my expenses paid for usually. So it's like a nice glorified hobby and I get to compete and they actually made a trading card of me. Nice. <laughs> as that sounds. And so, you know, I sign cards and stuff and it's sort of another kind of platform besides music to be honest with you, be able to travel, to be able to meet new people and to be able to interact with uh, people that maybe I haven't seen in a while. Sure. And well, so, uh, yeah, I, I understand, like, <clears throat> and even if you read some of the, excuse me, some of the stories um, that came out at certain public, certain online um, entertainment or video game magazines or what have you, you always see the comments after the story, like, well, this guy must live in his parents' basement, like you were saying, and be an absolute loser. But, um, but no, it's more of a hobby. And uh, I have a friend, actually, who owns a business called Arcade Game Sale right here in Fort Lauderdale. And um, it's like a repair shop. He buys, sells, trades, pinball machines, classic arcade cabinets. He builds cabinets. And actually, I do a side event with him now um, during the fall and winter months. Like once a month, we uh, convert the shop into an 80-style arcade. There's usually always 60 to 70 machines in there. And we charge a flat rate admission at the door like for adults and kids. And then we put all the games on free play and it's all you can play all night. It's become a very popular uh, <clears throat> community event down here in the Fort Lauderdale area that I'm happy to promote, advertise and host. And so uh, it's literally gotten to that point where I'm definitely actively involved when time allows away from actual work right. to, uh, to be involved with this, uh, this arcade community of people who are also awesome people and, 
just really sweet, nice, great, much like, you know, I meet when I'm on tour or through the music scene. Um, it's sort of like an alternate kind of vehicle to, uh, to get out there and be active and do stuff that you love. So, yeah, no, it's, it's super rad. I mean, I definitely, I, 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 <laughs> I love that notion of like we were talking about earlier, just the, the ability to um, influence different communities, because obviously you can take all of the same principles that you, you know, learned from, you know, whatever the DC hardcore scene and all the DIY stuff that um, you learned in, in all the bands that you played in and obviously apply that same exact hustle to, uh, you know, video gaming. And just that idea that it's like sometimes people learn about it, that whole DIY culture in different ways. But to, for you to be able to live in two worlds, it's like it's a much more... Um, readily accessible thing for the fact that you can start something in South Florida and just be like, yo, how about you show up here? There's some cool video games. And everyone's like, cool. How do I do that? And it's like, well, you just do it. Like <laughs> you just well, get you your know, friends together. Exactly. You know, what's funny though. The two communities, like people I know from both mediums, I guess you could say, mm-hmm. know nothing about the other thing I do or are not even as familiar with the other thing I do. Like some of my friends who are, who I just, have developed friendships with through the arcade stuff. Right. Like they have no idea that I play music or they, they barely, you know, they know about it maybe, but they don't understand to what degree or level that, you know, I actually go out with a band and tour or whatever. And then same thing with the music community. It's like, they think that they hear the arcade stuff and they just think, Oh, that's yeah, just like a funny antidote. Or that's a, <laughs> yeah. you know, just sort of a funny kind of side thing to know about somebody, but they don't realize the, the, um, the uh, level of activity that I do. So it's sort of funny. I, I, I I find it, you know, amusing. It's yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> no, totally. So yeah, you can live these two secret lives, and people are just like, "Oh, that's that cute thing that Steve does on the side." You're just like, "Well, it's pretty important." <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, that's really cool. hilarious. Well, dude, thank you so much, Steve. I honestly really appreciate it. this. Has been fun for me to, uh, yeah, get really, uh, get really granular with you and uh, pick your brain about this, a lot of this stuff. So thank you. I really appreciate it. No, awesome, man. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, fun indeed. Right. Steve, video games. I just love that he is so good at video games. <laughs> it just makes me happy because uh, I I played a crap load of video games when I was a little kid. And I, walked, I would say that I, I still play video games, but it's a very limited capacity. It's usually with my five-year-old son who is uh, more or less just watches me play the video games he wants to see played. But um, I just love the, uh, the dedication to the craft and the love of nostalgia of just being able to spend hours playing these games. I still, every time I see a Miss Pac-Man game in some gas station or somewhere else, I always have to sit down and play, even if it's like, oh man, I only have like 10 minutes to do that. Well, no, I'll, I'll do this. I definitely distinctly remember one time on tour just absolutely punishing the guys in my band um, when we were stopped at some you know random gas station in the middle of nowhere, and there was a Miss Pac-Man machine, and I was on a roll. I probably played for forty or so minutes, and I'm fairly certain I was either first or second as far as the high score was concerned on that particular machine. And it was uh, it got to the point where it's like the guys were like, "Dude, seriously, die! We need to go." <laughs> but anyways, thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much, Dana, his publicist, for hooking this up. I appreciate that. And uh, yes, business stuff. Use the Amazon affiliate code, the link. You can find that in the show notes. Just click on that link, save it to your desktop, save it to your phone, shop through Amazon using that link, and I get a kickback. It's like 4% of whatever it is you're buying. Your prices stay the same. Nothing is different besides the fact that the show gets a kickback, which is awesome. So do that, and you don't have to donate money, which, you know, to be honest, you don't have to donate money because this thing is continuing on from ad support, and I appreciate that. But I did recently get a dollar donation, and I really appreciate that. That's sort of like a, uh, I guess, a tip. Like, the internet says, like, hey, what's up, man? Here, here's a dollar. Hey, thanks. I appreciate that. So, yes, there's that. Visit the website, 100wordspodcast.com, and there's also a show archive up there. I recently was able to work with the podcast hosting company that I work with, and uh, they had this uh, nice little feature where I'm able to feature all of the shows in one convenient player. So uh, do that because there's, uh, you know, 197 of these things up now. So uh, go ahead and do that. And until next week, please be safe, everybody. Oh, wait, (laughs) just kidding. I told you I was going to tease who's coming up next week. And that's not even a tease because I'm just going to tell you. It's uh, Bo Thompson. He does a thing called Das Bootleg. And uh, technically, this is kind of the first thing he's done from an interview perspective uh, on his company. Um, and it's, it's a little risky because uh, there are some chances that uh, he could get that 
side of his business <laughs> taken away because it is a um, you know it, it it the name of the company definitely travels within that that circuit. So Das Bootleg. So you can kind of figure out what that means. But anyways, Bo is on the show next week, and it was a really really good discussion with an old friend. So please, like I said, be safe, everybody. You've been listening to the Jabberjaw Podcast Network, JabberjawMedia.com. This episode is brought to you by Toyota. Toyota is a leader when it comes to electrified vehicles. Today, battery EVs make up less than 10% of new vehicles sold because of higher cost and concerns about range and charging. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon-neutral future. With an electrified, diversified lineup of hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery EVs, Toyota empowers you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint. Learn more and get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Have you heard about Vivgard? Fgard Tigamod Alpha F Cab? Ask your neurologist if Vivgard could be right for you. And learn more at vivgard.com slash learn. That's V-Y-V-G-A-R-T dot com slash learn. Brought to you by Argenics.